So joining us for more on that is Anthony Fanukuk, a professor of international studies at Abu Beki School of Public and International Affairs from the University of South Africa from Pretoria. We also have Tim Anderson, director at the, counter, at the Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies, joining us out of Sydney. And gentlemen, welcome. Anthony, if I could start with you, what's your thoughts here? We know more than 20 states formally applied to join uh, BRICS. Iran and five others have been chosen as members in this initial phase. Why have these countries been picked or what do they have in common? Yeah, <clears throat> good morning and thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's not often that, uh, that we have the opportunity to talk to, uh, to colleagues from Iran directly, uh, so I welcome this. Um, I think it's, it's quite important for BRICS to develop a, a larger footprint in its quest uh, to uh, develop a multilateral response to the unilateral hegemony of the Americans. And in doing so, uh, the BRICS alliance had to select very carefully, uh, based on very clear criteria, uh, new members. Um, and and they, indeed, you know, there was a long list of applicants, and uh, clearly, no no international organisation can simply allow or admit everybody. It seems to me that one of the uh, determining criteria was to ask members or to invite members, uh, potential members who are significant players in their own region with important political and economic influence in the region and who shares at least some basic assumptions um, uh, and principles that underlies the working together of the global south. And in that way, I think they selected these countries. Uh, we, we might have to discuss whether it's, these are wise decisions. <laughs> But for now, it is clear to me that uh, the BRICS alliance was thinking that the heads of the five uh, states, that it would make sense to have a Latin American presence beyond Brazil um, and a presence in the Arab world, um, uh, including Egypt, Iran and Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And perhaps in the future in Southeast Asia, there might be another member or two to come in. So it makes sense to me, you know, in summary, that BRICS has very cautiously decided to expand by inviting six new members in the quest to begin to form a platform that will allow the global south to speak with much more confidence economically and politically and culturally, if you want, uh, about the shaping of the new world order as the Americans are beginning to decline and as the East is beginning to rise. Interesting. You know, Tim, what's your take for you know, for sovereign states who face U.S. hegemony, what does joining organizations like BRICS, for example, in this case, bring for them? Yes, I broadly agree with our friend's uh, analysis there. The, what it brings to the countries that want to join, and there is a long queue of countries beyond the six that are, have been invited to join on the 1st of January next year, it bring, gives to them the opportunity to participate in an emerging block to engage with trade and investment within that group, with technological exchange within that group, the fastest growing group in the world, which is very quickly going to outpace the G7 and the, um, the European countries, for example. Um, you notice also that with the inclusion of these six states, which are most of which are large economically powerful states, important in their region, also important in terms of energy. We have now probably a majority of the oil exporting countries and also a number of big or, uh, energy importers in that group there. So the, the internal trade with, within BRICS is going to become important. But BRICS is important also because it's redefining norms in the world. That is to say, for example, they have been involved in the largest anti-poverty program in their 16, 17 years of existence. So they have a lot of problems, but they're also uh, looking at the, the ways to deal with them. For example, in health, the health sector, they're talking about uh, public uh, health uh, policies when the G7 is talking about privatising health services to give a boost to the, the, the corporations of the, the Europeans and the North Americans. So that's, uh, it's an expanding group and I think 
countries are quite excited to participate and also of course to get out from the, the, the hegemony that our friend mentioned to get away from the dictatorship of the dollar. I think the the emergence of a new financial system at the moment it seems to be a basket of BRICS currencies we may end up with a with a single currency or at least with exchanging doing bilateral swaps within the group there's the beginnings of a movement away from the dictatorship of the dollar by which the US is inflicting such a lot of damage on not just its targets but all of the the third parties also get caught up in these sorts of um, so-called sanctions really unilateral coercive measures Right. Yeah. You know, Anthony, just expanding on this discussion a little further, how will BRICS benefit from Iran, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, for example, becoming new members? Yeah, uh, I, I see two or three avenues uh, of, of benefit. Uh, the one is geostrategic. I mean, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the UAE are strategically located in the Middle East as we call it, uh, and, and might play a very important bridging role. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, in a conversation earlier that uh, between Russia and China, you have Iran and also Saudi Arabia. But I think it's important, you know, to counter the, uh, the, the, the almost unchallenged influence, uh, power and aggressive foreign policies of the West in the Middle East. Uh, and I think that's the second important avenue uh, to bring a balance in, in power relations. But perhaps uh, thirdly, um, it is true, as Tim just said, that um, if you put together uh, the countries that have now become part of the enlarged BRICS in terms of energy security, it will, become, it will now become a very important player on the global stage. Uh, we are far from, uh, from saying goodbye to oil and gas as a source of energy. <laughs> Um, and it's important to make the transition, but I think uh, the, this new alliance will be able to determine terms uh, rather than be recipients of the, uh, the thinking and the philosophies of, of the Europeans, for example, when it comes to a transition uh, to, to new forms of energy. And then finally, I, I want to say that um, uh, something new for me is uh, these new members of BRICS will allow countries in Africa, in fact, the African continent, to reach out and improve its trade and investment uh, relations with these new members, which so far has been uh, on the scene, but fairly low key. And in fact, I think um, some of these new members will bring new life to the BRICS bank uh, the development bank and then allow BRICS members uh, to tap into those resources rather than make uh, deals with the devil, which is the IMF and the World Bank and those who come with uh, difficult uh, preconditions and political uh, uh, requests. Right. OK. And just finally, Tim, do you see perhaps the uh, Saudi Arabia the United Arab Emirates weaning themselves off American influence, which has been denounced on numerous, countless occasions as a source of instability in the West Asia region. They would certainly like to do it. Um, it certainly the Saudis have been looking for some counter leverage for some time. Of course, they have a reputation as being the, the client state of the Americans. Um, being a cash cow for them, buying their weapons, um, being involved in funding terrorism and so on. But at the same time, they've been humiliated by their role. Uh, Trump in particular made a point, I don't know why, to humiliate the Saudis over the, 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 the Slavic type of role that they're playing there. So for in a different way, because Iran, of course, is openly confronting the, the US attacks on independent states and peoples in the region, but the Saudis also uh, even though they've worked in the interests of the U.S., have an interest in trying to establish some sort of um, counterweight there. And uh, BRICS is, is important, and China is important for them, of course. Of course, it's a balancing act that they're going to have to develop themselves, but they know the, the North Americans better than most of us. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Let me thank our guests for their contribution. Anthony Fanukuk is a professor of international studies at Tabu Beki School of Public and International Affairs, University of South Africa, joining us from Pretoria. And also Tim Anderson, director at the Center for Counter-Hegemonic Studies from Sydney. That brings an end to another edition of the News Review.